Коллеги, пожалуйста, минуточку внимания. Прошу тишины. Первым докладом в третьей секции будет ориентированное бурение боковых ответвлений. Докладчик Адил Гареев Ирек Нагимович, главный инженер Таграс Римсервис. Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear and see me. Yes, it seems to work fine. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to introduce the technology for CT-based directional drilling for site tracking operations for heterogeneous and unconventional reservoirs. We're going to use the technology that we're going to explain the technology used by Tednet company, as well as the results for production increase at the Brownfields. Recently, we are entering more and more hard to recover reserves carbonate reservoirs. Currently, the production rate does not allow us to indeed reach out for the lower level carbonates and the total love, a total share of the recovery deposits stands at around 21% at the oil fields where we would operate, which basically means that we are underperforming in the in the field and burning the wells, especially when they're getting waterlogged or when there's a need for additional production stimulation. We're also working at the low bottom hole pressure at around 50 to 30 percent of the starting pressure. All these factors have the negative impact at the flow rate and the well yield. To intensify the well production in these conditions, we are applying a simple hydrochloric acids and selective acid stimulation technologies. We're also running the wells with opal with open horizontal completion, where acid treatment efficiency also goes down over time and does not provide the cost to benefit ratio that the customer would expect it to produce. So together with the customer, we have implemented the directional drilling project when testing different technologies with field test different methods of site tracking from running several shorter site tracks to a single extended reach side side walls and ultimately our experience suggests that it's better to drill out horizontal wells and side tracks with extended reach rather than opting out for numerous shorter ones. And simple pumping down the acid and down the well actually enabled up to 40% uh, increase and 135% increase in the flow rate with the hydro monitored drilling. An important factor is the, is the inclination of, of the side track from the mother bore. If the, if the inclination is uh, below five meters, then uh, the increase in production rate is not substantial, but we can reach up to 95 and 180% greater production rate when doing side tracking design and operations. As a result of our operations, we have arrived at the optimal combination of the technical parameters of similar jobs. Whatever implementing these projects, we've also, uh, we've also done R&D and held a number of sessions. In 2019, we signed an agreement to implement fieldworks to produce directional drilling system running on the coil tube together with Navinka company. So what does our directional drilling toolkit is made of. We have uh, the uh, joint, radiating joint, uh, the logging module, reverse valve joint, and it also includes uh, the 
the, the PC, the logging module and the power unit. The connector includes the logging connector, telemetry module offers rather precise inclinometer readings. It uses solid body hyperscopes and it enables for encasing orientation while sustaining high pressure and loads. The rotating joint is designed to ensure entering of the bottom hole string down the drilled section of the of the well war. The data feed and power feed is done by the well had equipment. There is the cable that runs down the CD tube. Using this string gives us the inclination of up to 19 degrees with the drilling radius of up to 30 meters. We run down the technological strings to settle the whipstop and orient the drilling bit. So the drilling string runs down, and depending on the on how the whipstock is settled, then we do the side tracking job right here. Well, this is the slide that lists the advantages of using the city string based drilling because people in the audience are well expected to know that. The further point of growth for the technology is to enable side tracking from the case well. So this is something that we're currently developing and the possibility of drilling out of the vertical wells with the drilling radius of under 20 meters. That is all for me at this point. If you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you so much. Are there any questions at this point? Do we need a microphone over there? Because there is a question from the floor. I'm from Jack Volga. Could you tell us, you haven't tested it yet, but I know that you have experience of uh, drilling without the that without the telecontrol system and what and what was the drilling pace and the intensity and without the tele system we did it from 0 0.2 meters per hour up to seven meters per hour depending on the geology and uh, the spacing was about five to 14 meters off the motherboard. So use the autonomous standalone inclinometer. Well, the first one was done without the inclination meter of the, for the ones indeed involved the inclinometer. And you're using the hydraulic indexator that just rotates uh, by 30 degrees uh, using the hydraulic drive. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Would there be any, any other questions? If no, then thank you. The next one up is about uh, Comgas modular mobile air separators by Dmitry Luzianin. Good afternoon. It's always a good audience to speak in front of. I hope everyone can hear me now. It's uh, always interesting to see professionals discuss their tools and uh, play things. I'm going to offer new tools and instruments. They do not specifically have any relation to coil tubing, but hopefully you might have use for our tools as well. So our company has been producing the liquid nitrogen producing units. Nitrogen is getting more and more use in the oil and gas industry. 
and we are offering non-membrane units, but the liquefied nitrogen production units, it does not see universal application, it's used for very special and specific jobs, but we're running into more and more such jobs since the wells are becoming more and more tricky to run. And hopefully, whenever you run into the need for liquid nitrogen, you, we are the ones you think you come up with. We have been producing these units for two years now. They are rather really unique, they are modular, container-based, so they can be shipped, delivered, brought to in 40 feet containers to basically any destination. Like I said, this is a modular design, which is quite easy to set up at the oil field, it's exactly where you need them. can actually be dropped off the helicopters. It takes up, up to 10 days to set them up, usually 5 to 7, and they are operation ready, so they provide full performance in two days after the setup. So this is uh, the simplified layout. It includes column air separator, compressor, and the purifier it produces liquefied nitrogen, and uh, it also offers storage reservoirs for further applications. These are the performance figures and production rates. So we have the nitrogen producing units from 5 tons per day up to 15 tons per day. Or using Samsung compressors. The most important thing that I wanted to mention are not the gas units themselves, but the opportunities that we offer to gas service companies and oil service companies. Basically, we offer on-site operation of our units. So we arrive at your site, produce nitrogen and oil and service companies. They just take off as much liquefied nitrogen as they need. And our units are run by our staff. They are operated by our personnel, which means that we bear all the risks of running the units and the customer basically gets as much liquefied nitrogen as they need. And these are the storage facilities that we also offer, uh, including gas delivery, gas transportation and gas storage system. Transportable, vertical, horizontal, you name it. The projects that we have implemented so far for gas, oil and service company half a ton per hour production rate. Also, Nova Urengoy oil field and Narilsk are three sites that we're now covering. We produce not only nitrogen producing units, but also nitrogen and uh, oxygen producing units, which is uh, an important uh, capacity that we're now using during COVID times to produce medical grade oxygen. We are producing not only units, but basically all everything that runs on technical gases, cryogenic units, production units, transportation, storage, pressurized vessels. In this slide, you see the gas transportation units, depending on you know, whatever you need, nitrogen, oxygen, 25, uh, 250 bars pressure. This is a unique design. We're the only company capable of doing them in Russia at this point. And I know for sure that other companies use it to transport helium. So I hope that this might be interesting for you at some point. Thank you. Any questions? Very well. Now we're ready to take the second speaker. The next one is going to be online. Successful overcoming the challenges of large platform 
by Stephen Craig, technical manager for City of Pressure Pumping International. Хочу рассказать вам об успешном преодолении ограничений малых платформ при проведении операции с использованием колтюбинга. Эта презентация подготовлена мной и моим коллегой господином Чермером. Necessary milling, gas lifting, or solids removal. The fracture treatments would be pumped via a separate dedicated North Sea stimulation vessel. Many offshore locations present operational challenges to us, though this project seemed to combine multiple issues. To start, the platform was small. Certainly, we had insufficient deck space for all the required equipment to be located. A catenary type unit was not available, so the alternative was to place the majority of the pumping and fluid storage on a supply vessel, leaving coil tubing and fluid initial fluid return equipment on the platform. The vessel itself cho that was chosen was not particularly large, and this also presented logistical challenges. A detailed plan for rig up was created for each major operational stage, both for the platform and the vessel during loadout execution and backload. The coil tubing reel required for this operation weighed approximately 30 tons. This vastly exceeded platform limitations. For transfer, boat spooling was selected as the viable alternative. As always, health, safety and environment is critical and we utilize specialized personnel to enhance the local crew knowledge. This is primarily focused on the boat spooling and the clean out of tooling that was utilized. Both on the vessel and on the platform, client and supplier company supervisory personnel were placed and to permit any potential for erratic weather, a dynamically positioned two DP2 vessel was selected to support the operation. Moving on to the well challenges, the well presented two major challenges for us. First, low bottom hole pressure that with conventional cleaning would require multiple slower wiper trips and utilize excessive nitrogen volumes. And two, a temporary solid separation system had restrictions on the solids return rate. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending the solution the, uh, was to the utilize our event today tubing late vacuuming late system with jet the pump SJ. PHA. With a long build this angle, this system effectively boosts downhole pressure, providing returns to the surface at sufficient annular velocity in the coil, in the inner to outer coil concentric to keep the solids fluidized and returning without the need for any nitrogen. This operation utilizes a two inch by one inch concentric string. As I said, the power fluid is circulated via, down via the inner string and the returns via the two inch by one inch annulus. These operations require a reel with two rotating joints and modified in reel treating iron. A further benefit of this system is that the solids are returned at a steady rate, not exceeding the capacity of the solid separator. Traditional forward circulating two phase cleanouts in low bottom hole pressures with wiper trips, well, they could have cleaned the well, 
can result in all of the solids returning over a very short time frame. For this particular operation, unacceptable. Additional challenges were that the well had low levels of H2S present, enough to exceed NACE, sour threshold, but not sufficient to mandate the use of anti-cracking inhibitor. Typically, we do not utilize scavenger control H2S for coil tubing operations, but with, in this case, with the predictable fluid return rates via the jet pump system, scavenger concentrations could be accurately predicted to transfer and uh, handle the H2S on the return side. Historic operations in the field had experienced coil tubing abrasion damage. This would have been due to the chrome completion. A generic example of what happens with abrasion damage and chrome completion is illustrated. There's a flat spot on the coil tubing, and then eventually during pressure test, the coil tubing will burst along that length. An advantage of concentric coil tubing is that we require very limited pipe movement. Very few wiper trips are necessary. Additionally, we decided to utilize a metal-on-metal -metal lubricant to reduce drag and mitigate abrasion risk. Finally, due to scaling concerns, seawater was not permitted for circulation. Fresh water would be supplied from tanks on the vessel and due to a zero discharge policy, this will be recirculated back to that vessel. Looking back on the project, I think the only challenge missing from this selection was that this was actually a manned platform with accommodation on board. If it was a normally unmanned installation, pretty much every challenge possible would have been available to us. So we'll start by focusing on the boat spooling operation. The service company concerned had conducted several of these operations in the North, in the North Sea, and learnings from those performed formed the basis of the practices used for this operation. The initial preparation. Operations initiated with the vessel delivering the platform spooling equipment only. The vessel returned to dock. During the period that the vessel was not there, the platform coil tubing equipment was rigged up which is the photographs you can see here with the reel and the uh, injector on a tilt table at the side of the platform. The injector, um, the reel was placed on a turntable and this allows, allows the uh, operating reel to be collect, correctly aligned with the injector as the operation was centered over four different wells. So we didn't have uh, any bending between the reel and the gooseneck. And additionally, the stripper brass was replaced with larger ID brass and the wire was wound around the platform reel, as you can see in the top photograph, and that was fed through the injector. And the bottom right photograph illustrates uh, the wire coming down through from a previous op operation. Now, while that equipment was being rigged up offshore, the vessel had returned to port and a second coil tubing unit and spooler was assembled assembled. Typically, a WECO connection would be utilized for pulling, winching the coil up to the platform and then fed through the injector. And we would normally remove a couple of gripper inserts and just allow this additional OD to come through the chains. However, in this particular case, because this was a concentric coil tubing, and we would have to access that inner string inside the reel later, we utilize a dimple type connector and this was all two inch OD. So we had uh, one little op, uh, advantage there. The equipment was C-fastened and a second injector laid horizontally with a fan tail guide to help align the coil tubing coming from the C into the uh, injector, into the vessel injector. A shear BOP was placed below the injector. In the event that the operation required emergency cutting, it was deemed optimal to have the cut from the vessel to avoid trailing coil tubing behind the vessel, possibly impacting propellers. Plus, should we cut the pipe from the platform, then there was a risk of that pipe falling down, creating damage or injury to personnel at lower levels on, the opera, on that platform. So once that vessel returned, to location, 
we were ready to start the operation. We checked that the weather conditions were deemed suitable for the duration and the platform wire was lowered down to the vessel with the crane. It was hooked to the, co the coil tubing and spooled back to the platform in a steady and synchronized manner. With the coil tubing now stabbed through the platform injector and pulled close to the reel, the wire on the platform reel was removed. The pipe was then stabbed into the reel and prepared for the concentric CT reel iron. On the external CT, uh, a grapple type connect a grapple type WECO connector was utilized to, to avoid any hot work. So we pulled the cable up, removed this uh, coil, moved this connector, installed the grapple style 1502 crossover connection. And this also has uh, a pump in port with two seals. So we were able to check the integrity of the, uh, the sealing assembly here prior to spooling on. Because once that coil spooled on, we weren't able to do any further work. So we wanted to be able to pressure test early in the job. Once that had been confirmed, we then commenced spooling. This was continued until all the coil tubing was through the vessel injector. An additional length of wire was then wound around the reel on the vessel, attached to the coil tubing on the vessel to ensure that we had complete constrained pipe during the complete transfer up to the platform. The coil was not allowed to be flying around loose. This wire would also be required at the very end of the operation to pull the coil tubing down and through the vessel in the opposite method. At this point, the vessel departed to offload the spooling coil tubing unit and returned with a small tower system, tools, single pump, and the flowback system. With the required coil tubing and flowback equipment now located on the platform and any excess equipment removed, we could now focus on getting the vessel ready for the pumping uh, operations. Below deck on the, on the vessel, we had capacity for 1,500 barrels with a separate 1,500 barrel for return storage. Fluid was supplied to the platform via a high pressure two inch hose and returned downstream of a choke system via a lower pressure three inch hose. Again, similar to the uh, boat spooling operation, the weak point in the system was vessel based, allowing the hoses to swing away from the vessel into the sea in an emergency. All the operations on every operational rig up we had, we utilized a double fluid pump, blender and various chemicals. At certain stages of the operation, we were required to conduct additional acidizing operations we were set up with uh, acid tanks for that. And then at uh, various, various times we could switch back to running uh, nitrogen tanks. As per the operations on the platform, a detailed vessel layout drawing was prepared and a numbering of all the valves to ensure consistent uh, operations were set up. Sorry for the dog. So risk mitigation, I want to highlight a few of those aspects. A single fluid pump was located on the platform as at certain points in the job, the vessel would, no, would not be there and was returning to port. And this was hooked up purely to the BOP kill line. This pump was an emergency kill operations and would utilize seawater as required. Not what we planned to do and we didn't have to utilize it, but it was there just in case. To reduce the risk of abrasion damage, lubricated fluid slugs, was pumped via the kill port on the BOP to increase the height of weighted completion and to reduce the coefficient of friction. H2S inhibitor, as I said earlier, was not technically required, but we did circulate through in an abundance of caution. As any damage to the pipe on this operation would have serious impact, would seriously impact the project economics. H2S scavenger was circulated via the treating fluid to convert any sour products in the return system um, as there were concerns on returning sour fluids to the vessel tanks. The scavenger had sufficient mix and reaction time during travel from the downhole jet pump to surface. As stated earlier, we had crews on both the platform and vessel, and they remained there with suitable supervisory personnel. A total of 16 from our company were offshore. As the jet pump system takes returns via a concentric coil tubing, a second shear blind ram was required in the surface PCE stack, pressure control equipment stack, as no flow check assembly is available in this type of operation. 
some lessons learned. Initially, the platform injector had some levels of slippage when it was resting on these spreader beams. Even though we tied that down, there was a little bit of alignment challenges. And on future operations, um, we removed those after checking, rechecking deck loading capabilities. Additionally, we put in even larger brass to assist in the stripper rubber and the stripper assembly uh, when guiding through because the, the handling sub was a little challenging to get through there, through the dual stripper on the platform-based equipment. The brass guides in the fan tail down here were replaced with Teflon. This was due to minor scratching. This is uh, when we were replacing those, we did a, a minor scratching on the photograph bottom right did occur to the coil tubing, but this was conveniently at one end of the coil tubing, it was very shallow, and we just were able to cut that pipe off. And for future operations, we would try and utilize just a single ram emergency pipe cutter to reduce the length of the assembly on the, on the vessel. Finally, it would be ideal to have a drop-in drum type reel, which would make the treating iron assembly inside uh, uh, the dished ends, which we had to use, uh, would be much quicker to return. To achieve. In conclusion, the operation to spool the pipe was successfully completed. During a long operation, zero HSE or lost time incidents were recorded from all personnel from all companies. The abrasion and sour service mitigations were successful. No damage was recorded or noted on the pipe. It's worth noting that the initial on spooling took 105 hours and the unspooling nine hours at the end of the campaign. We followed with a subsequent operation with standard two inch coil in July, 2019. The spooling onto the platform dropped from 105 hours in this operation to 13 hours. This was aided by a simpler real makeup, but uh, the local staff had gained significant valuable knowledge during the first campaign and they executed this very well. The next campaign uh, was actually to remove 76,000 pounds of propent with a reverse circulating operation, and that will be covered in an SPE paper at ICOTA SPE conference in 2021 in March. So in acknowledgement, I'd like to thank the, uh, the paper co-authors, Nebsa Sharma, Ayad Gwembri, and Kevin Peter for their efforts and contribution to the project, and appreciate the efforts of all the personnel in Tunisia with Baker Hughes, the client, and the other service providers for a successful, complex, and safe operation. Thank you very much. We thank the presenter for the interesting uh, intervention. So there are no questions that can be uh, presented since this is a pre-recorded video, right? Смотрите, получается, если какие-то вопросы, получается, организаторы их запишут, отправят автору этой презентации. However, the organizers can put down your questions and send it to the presenter. So if you have any questions, please communicate them to the organizer. Хорошо. Перейдем тогда к следующему докладу. Он тоже будет онлайн. Тема его «Колтюбинг повышенной надежности». We're going to speak about the high resilience coil tubing and how does the slippage affect the service life of the coil tubing by Scott Sherman. какие-то технические проблемы хорошо пока у нас получает техническая проблема с этой презентацией so far we seem to be running into technical issue with this presentation so we're bringing up the next one it's going to no, I'm ready to go. If you guys are ready to go, I'm ready to go. Then we're going with the next presentation at this point. I'm ready to go if you're ready to go. Здравствуйте, коллеги. 
Как уже многие говорили, приятно всех видеть здесь в такое непростое well, время. Good afternoon, indeed, colleagues. It's indeed exciting to see all of you during these trying times, and it's uh, good to see faces in the audience. And while my presentation is being brought up, I would like to give you the best regards of uh, our general director from Shinde Company, who is also attending this meeting online. And hopefully, together with ICOTA, we'll be able to make this industry better. I would also like to inform you that since today, Shinda Company is going for IPO, we've got all the approvals. So if anyone wants to buy our shares, you're welcome to do so. So this is my presentation up already. Okay, good. A few words about the company. Shinde Company is the part of the Huatong Group that was set up in 1993. It's located in Tenshan, 100 kilometers off Beijing and 100 kilometers off the seaport of we are one of the largest producers of cable products in China, including the oil and gas industry. Out of the products that we have been supplying to Russia, that would be only logging cables. And we have all the certificates, all the permits, so if you have any need for logging products, please go ahead. We can discuss all these different options. We're also producers of high-quality products for oil and gas industry across the world. We have more than 1,400 people on staff. Most of them are people with degrees, with PhDs, and distinguished experts in their fields. This is uh, the 3D layout of our production facility. A few words about uh, the production capacity of Shinde Company. As of now, we have three, three CD production lines, two, two lines with laser welding, and one line with ERW welding. So, 18 lines for production of capillary tubes and four lines for, production, for producing encapsulated pipes. I will be showing all these different products. We have the, the Quality Assurance Laboratory, highly qualified staff, and we have rather strong proprietary R&D and scientific center that together with the Chinese Science Academy produces a lot of interesting findings. So briefly, what I'm going to speak about today, I'll talk about the changes that we've had in the production process, so things that we've recently updated, our main products and the new products for ICCT and their commercial availability. A few words about the recent upgrades. You all know that every product has bottlenecks. For the CT tube, the bottleneck is the angled weld that are usually bearing additional load during the operations. During the pandemic, we did not waste any time by sitting idle. We signed a new project, financed it. And since this summer, we've launched a new production session that is that does angular welding, that has a lot of unique properties, both for both for the in terms of the end products and in terms of the production process. First of all, this is 100% control of every weld. And we're all looking, special, uh, we're looking at special technology to improve the strength of the bias welds. So all these welds are 
on par in terms of the parameters of, of the conventional pipe in terms of strength, and which means that we're able to project the service life of the welded pipe. Even though there are global producers who are producing now the thermally fortified tubes, including for our products, we have set up the new bias welding production line and updated in July the facility we're now producing the TECT thermally enhanced cold tubing with up to 130 grade. So these are the images and parameters of this section. I'll be skipping through some of the slides. I can actually leave this presentation with you, so you can have, you can have a look at it and browse through it in your spare time. There are several slides that actually show how these two novelties that we've introduced in our production facility improve the performance of our products. All the photographic study shows that the grain size changes at the, at the weld and how much they get restored after the operations that we introduce at the stage of production. So, I will give you more detail when we speak during the breaks, if you like. We're now receiving ST certifications, and we are updating our certificates. We're also running the Q1 certificate and all other certificates as well, both to produce and sell worldwide. And we have secured many approvals from international service companies. This is what the laser welding looks like. I just wanted to focus uh, on this. All the slides going forward will be about the tubes that are laser welded. Because there are other specific features about laser welding. Also, the presentation seems to be seems to be lagging a little bit. Anyway, so the main advantages of the laser welding are the minimum height and the minimum area of thermal degradation. And this degradation is getting optimized further. It also offers opportunity for welding different materials. So you see the list of materials that uh, can be welded together to produce both coil tubing and capillary tubes. And we do that as standard products commercially available. We have the experience of producing titanium tubes, light and powerful tube for offshore operations. The rest of the products are quite typical for all coal tubing producers from, seven, from grade 70 to grade 170, and we are able to produce in grade 130, grade 135, so this might be actually part of our standard product range. And the wall thickness also across the entire range. This is what we produce from non-conventional steels and alloys. So all this we are doing both in standard design, which means that the diameters and wall thicknesses are across the standard and conventional ranges. We use also stainless steel tubes, but of course stainless steel tubes are a bit pricier, and the customers should always be looking at the cost and benefit ratio when uh, opting for a certain alloy and material to be used. A few words about the capillary tubing. 
ряд, который выпускается глобально, мы их выпускаем. So here's the product range that we produce. 18 линий, как я уже говорил, не надо. 18 production lines that I recently mentioned for capital tubes. Значит, тоже достаточно устойчивый спрос на эту продукцию. Also, we have rather sustainable demand across the world for this product. And hopefully, in Russia, we'll also see growing demand both as a separate tube and as part of the ESP. We're currently working with local producers and local customers. Maybe there will be demand, greater demand for this kind of tubing in the Russian market in the immediate future. Now, I would like to tell you a few words about the new product that Chinda is being promoting rather heavily, and I talked about that last year as well. But anyway, I'm going to still mention it as a new product, because the system can only be uh, produced with laser welding technology. And because of our unique welding technology, we're able to produce complicated systems, complicated tubes that also include capital tubes, coil tubes, and cable products and different combinations thereof that uh, are always in high demand and can be specifically tailored to the needs of a particular project. We also produce and design these systems in close coordination with our clients. So this is a joint, always a joint project. We're not just, uh, you know, producing every, every Everything is tendered and then just uh, pitching it to our clients. We also we always look at our clients and are informed by their needs. We usually need to provide cost-efficient solutions to all the complicated challenges. The CT uh, that also includes the Kevlar tube and cables becomes basically a dedicated tool. It's not just a universal CT for for application across a different range of projects. They usually require it for the specific jobs. Just showing you slides of uh, things that we've been producing recently. Now, here's a range of, of more complicated systems. And you see coil tubing here with another tube running inside of it with a insulated coating. And here we have controlling cables and logging cables that can communicate different signals, both uh, downward and upward. Another case, the heating cable. So this tubing on the outside looks like the coil tubing inside. There is the insulation coating, and the core is the heating cable. And this tube can maintain the temperature down its entire reach, constant temperature, which actually allows using it when you need to overcome some temperature-related issues with paraffins or highly viscous oil. Here's another system that includes the city on the outside and the capillary tubes on the inside it can be used for different applications. It doesn't, doesn't matter how many capillary tubes you see on the inside, it's uh, basically something that is tailored to the needs of the line depending on the project, their diameter and the content of the, two, of the capillary tubes. There may be logging cables, there may be some of the cables and control cables, so everything that we produce like, like that and in, in this design is informed by the needs and the requirements and specs of the client. Here we have the CD on the inside, and you see the power cable that, that runs down, smaller diameter, and which is polymer coated all across. This is a system that enables running down some tools and instruments 
down the well and working without the extra trips. This is the product that was both well tested and top five service companies have been doing field work with our products. So we can put several years of successful field operation under our belts in Africa and China and in other regions as well. So it's a CT that features the logging cable inside it. So it's basically a replacement for the outer sleeve. I'll show you in a few slides how that works. So that's what, what it looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like. So this is the ESP cable that runs down the the city is introduced into the city at the production stage, and it can be done with laser welding. The thing is that this product and any product from this ICCD range so first they, pr they produce everything on the inside. And then, whatever, so basically everything they put down, then there is the city that's welded over it. So when it's produced, on the inside, we have everything that we need to produce. So basically, this inner first cable is inside the tube, and this is how they end up with the tube around it. In Northern Africa, we had a project like this. So here are the project parameters. I didn't think I should spend too much time reading through it. This is the actual design solution that we've, uh, that we've been offering. On the left-hand side, you see the string with the external ESP cable, and on the right, you see the, the ESP cable running down the CT. So, there are no changes, either in terms of the diameter or in terms of the application. The only reason why we did that, I'll uh, explain a bit later in, in pictures. This we've been looking at three different ways of using it. conventional CT plus ESP. And the entire string that's being run down on the wire. So we see the most cost-efficient solution, and it's rather simple to operate. And rather high fault-free service life. It's also quite safe in terms of health and safety, because there are no external extra risk factors, basically using the entire, uh, using the CT to run the string up and down, up and, down. And, that and that means better health and safety for the personnel involved. So a few other benefits, as uh, mentioned by our client, and that enabled using this system commercially. So the main reasons was, of course, the cost and benefit analysis. Is this string saves a lot of time and money by minimizing the number of trips required. So 
Значит, теперь uh, все-таки хотел пригласить вас uh, к интересованной компании, к совместному проектированию систем, поскольку в данном случае мы смотрим на колтюбинговых систем, колтюбинговых систем, на, к сожалению, меньше маржинальный рынок. At a, at a market that where the profit margin is shrinking, both for us, the producers, and for the service companies, which means that we need to be looking at new ways of uh, optimizing operation, the market operations. Therefore, I invite all of you to cooperate with us and to develop tailored systems зарабатывать на этом рынке, развиваться, вкладывать, заработать в технологии, новые системы. разработки ICT систем ничего сложного. Later, we'll be able to discuss and discuss the technical specifications. Usually, we didn't take a long time to arrive at the stage of the commercial product. So that's briefly everything from me at this point. Задавайте, пожалуйста, вопросы. Any questions? Хорошо, спасибо большое спасибо. за интересный доклад. Yes, thank you, thank you, the presenter, for the interesting, you know, presentation. Наш доклад тоже будет. Next one is going to be about. It's going to be a line. It's about successful milling of plugs at high bottom hole pressure up to 15,000 psi and high temperature wells at the United Arab Emirates oil wells. It's going to be presented by Timur Sabitov, the sales manager from Tenaris Quilt Tubes. I think you made a mistake. I think I'm up next. Yes. So do I begin? It seems that now we're going to hear about high-strength coil tubing by Scott Sherman, who's going to speak about how is it being affected by slip damage. Technical Director of Nexus Energy. Scott, you're up. Okay, thank you. I'd like to begin if we could. So I think my screen is shared. If you could share it again. Okay. Um, so once again, my name is Scott Sherman. I'm a professional engineer. My current role is engineering manager uh, with Nexus Energy Technologies. We're an API facility and we specialize in coil tubing, BOPs and pressure control equipment. My past role was chief technology officer with Advanced Upstream. And prior to that, I was senior technical advisor at uh, Trican Well Service for nearly 15 years. In addition, I'm the president of the ICOTA Canada chapter, and I'd like to thank you all for joining my presentation. So as you can see, this paper was written for the Quail Tubing Well Intervention Conference uh, in the Woodlands, USA this past spring. And of course, that conference was canceled due to COVID-19 concerns. So we'll go to the next slide. So just as a background, the um, strength of coil tubing has doubled in the past 20 years. You know, back when I started in the industry, 70 grade coil tubing was very common. Um, we then went to 80 and 90 grade, and now you can commonly buy 140 grade coil tubing. So quench and tempered coil tubing is, uh, you know, it's been a real game changer in terms of coil tubing fatigue life, 
Uh, we can get further out into wells now. We can pull a lot harder than we used to be able to do. And some think it's less susceptible to operator damage. Um, and the theory there is because the coil is harder, um, it won't be damaged as easily um, from debris within the well bore. So we'll go to the next slide. So of course this harder or stronger coil, it's created some challenges and specifically some of the challenges are, you know, coil tubing connectors. They haven't changed much over the years and they were designed for 70 and 80 grade coil tubing. And now that coil tubing is twice as strong as it used to be, I mean, the picture here shows, you know, where a connector was ripped off the end of the coil because the grub screws just couldn't bite into the harder coil. The other um, comment with this is that, um, you know, as the tensile strength or yield strength as the coil tubing is doubled, it now takes double the uh, shear forces within the BOP to cut it. Um, and so, you know, companies, uh, including the one I work for, have had to make changes to our uh, BOP shear so we can cut this higher grade coil tube. Go to the next slide. So, you know, we were thinking about this and, you know, our hypothesis was that the fatigue life of high strength coil tubing may be more sensitive to slip damage than conventional coil tubing. And our rationale there was that you know, because the coil is harder, it's probably more notch sensitive. So we thought we would do some testing to see if we could prove that or disprove it. So our plan was to obtain samples from all of the uh, usual coil tubing suppliers that make this quenching tempered or high strength coil tubing. We wanted to go with the 188 or 190 wall, and we wanted to get 95, 110, 125, 130, and 140 grade um, samples from each of them. We also wanted to use a 100 grade sample as our standard. The plan was to hold the samples in the BOP and apply 100,000 pounds of tension um, and then remove them from the BOP and perform then fatigue testing to failure. And we standardized, we were going to standardize on 5,000 PSI um, and you know, kind of locate the slip marks in the sweet spot on the 72 inch band form. So of course, you know, no oh, next slide, sorry, you didn't catch that. So of course we, um, things didn't go per plan. You know, we asked for samples from quality tubing and Teneris coil tubes and global tubing. And, um, you know, within our timeline, what we actually got was uh, coil tubing with uh, varying wall thicknesses. So, you know, we, we, you can see here that we got 204 wall, 236 wall, 175, 204, 175 wall. I, we didn't even get any of the 188 or 190 wall that we initially had asked for. And that's just due to availability at the mills and what they're milling at the time. You know, we had a very tight timeline to get this done, um, you know, in time, in time to get the paper written. So, you know, we went ahead with what we had. Um, you know, we still conducted the testing as, as we had planned. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about our results. So I guess this slide, uh, next slide, yeah. I mean, this slide shows um, some of the pictures um, of the test equipment. So in the top left corner, you'll see that's a typical coil tubing BOP slip. So that's the slip that's like the slip rams and pipe rams, whatever you want to call them, that they grip the coil tubing. Picture in the top middle, those are the resulting slip marks on the coil tubing after, you know, the rams were, were um, actuated and we pulled the 100,000 pounds. The picture on the top right is uh, my old Ben fatigue machine from Trican. Um, that's what we used for doing this testing. So um, you can see that we located the... Uh, Actually, in that picture, you can't see it. That's an older picture I had, but, but uh, we put the uh, slip marks in the location um, on the Ben fatigue machine where we expected the failure to take place. So we would kind of put the most force possible. The bottom left picture is the BOP that was used. Just a single BOP was used with the slip rams in it. And then below that is our pull test stand. So we're able to pull 
know, do pipe light and pipe heavy testing uh, of coil tubing, um, which is mandated by API. And then the picture on the bottom right, so what that is, is that's an image of our optical comparator. So we applied um, metrology putty, so like a mastic putty to the slip marks, and we let it harden or cure. And then we removed that and sectioned it and we put it on the optical comparator. And what that allows us to do is to measure the depth of the slip marks kind of indirectly, but it's a very accurate way to do that. So we'll go to the next slide. So here's our results. Here's the bend fatigue results. So, you know, for each of these samples, the first one is the standard or the control. So that was the sample that was undamaged. So 130 grade, uh, 125, the 95 grade, those are all quench and tempered. Then we have the 100 grade, which was um, not quench and tempered or not high strength coil. Then we had two more 110 and 130 grade quench and tempered coil tubings. And the thing that stands out here is that the results were all over the place. You know, the, the probably the most uniform result was the E result, which was the far right 130 grade, where the post damaged um, pipe had very consistent results, whereas, you know, some of the other ones were all over the place, and we'll talk about why that might have been. So we'll go to the next slide. So, I mean, this is a table of the results, and I won't go through this in detail, but I think you guys all have this presentation available to you afterwards. Uh, if not, you can reach out to me for it. Uh, I won't dwell on this slide very much. Um, we'll move to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, we were not initially very happy with the results. Um, you know, I mean, what was consistent was that every sample cracked at the root of a slip mark. And that was within our expectations. But the cycles to failure was inconsistent between specimens of the same type. And, you know, it was very difficult for us to compare one coil tubing grade to another because the wall thickness is varied. Um, and we'd like to have had more specimens for a given quilt tubing grade um, that might have, you know, made the trends more evident. But the bottom line is, you know, based on these results is that higher strength quilt tubing doesn't necessarily imply higher hardness quilt tubing. And we'll talk about that in a follow on slide here. So, you know, initially we tried to see if there was a correlation between the depth of the slip marks and hardness. And you know, it's not quite what we found. Um, you know, certainly the coil tubing that had a hardness of 38 had a very shallow um, slip mark depth, maximum slip mark depth, but it still was um, deeper than um, high strength coil tubing with a hardness of only 24 Rockwell C. So, you know, that wasn't the correlation we were looking for. You know, we were hoping to have seen a, a trend, and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but we were hoping to see a trend, you know, that was kind of more linear, um, and that's not the case. So uh, we'll move to the next slide. So then we thought, well, if we try to do cycle life reduction versus coil tubing hardness, perhaps we'll see, um, you know, a strong correlation there. Um, and, and again, we didn't see that. Um, you know, the cycle life reduction, so this is the um, average of the two post-damaged um, um, coil tubing cycle lives um, subtracted, uh, or as a percentage of the undamaged um, pipe of the same type. And again, we didn't see, um, we didn't see a trend. Um, you know, so so we thought, well, okay, what else could this be? Maybe we need to look at the wall thickness. So we'll move to the next slide. So, you know, because the wall thickness varied, uh, we did the defect depth as a percentage of wall thickness. So effectively, you know, your effect, what does the meaning, meaningful notch depth from the, from the coil tubing um, slips? And, and again, we didn't see a significant... Um, cycle life reduction as a function of wall thickness. It was a little bit all over the place. Um, so that was, that was interesting as well. So we'll move to the next slide. So kind of our conclusions were that, you know, the mechanical damage from BOP slips, it does decrease fatigue life. 
that that's for sure. That and that was kind of within our expectations. But what did surprise us was the range is considerable. You know, it varied from a 1.6 percent degradation to you know a little bit over 50 percent um, life degradation, and that's from one time setting the slips. Um, you know, it, it seems to be more dependent on the sample type, um, not so much on the grade, the hardness or defect. And again, you know, the results were very scattered. Um, and so it's really difficult for us to draw correlations between fatigue rate reduction um, and hardness or defect depth or, you know, coil tubing grade. Uh, the data collected in the study indicates that uh, high-grade coil tubing is no more or less susceptible to fatigue life degradation than conventional coil tubing. And, you know, we can, you know, stand behind that because the 100-grade standard coil tubing performed just as well as the um, as the uh, high-strength coil tubing in, in many cases. So, if we were to do this again. Um, you know, we would make sure that we had all the coil tubing samples with the same wall thickness. You know, I mean, we couldn't make that work in the time frame that we had, but, you know, if, if we could take longer to collect samples, um, that's, that would be a, a must. Uh, we'd like to do this with uh, more samples, so 10 or more samples of each coil tubing grade. And the one thing we didn't do, and it's just because the lab tech didn't, uh, didn't think about this, but something that might have skewed our results. It might have explained the difference between the, the two tests of the same grade that gave different results was if we had oriented the ERW the same when we set the slips each time, um, that might have given more uniform results because, uh, you know, in the bent fatigue machine, there's a standard that you always orient the ERW, which is the seam weld in the same direction. So we should have done the same um, when we did the uh, application of the slips. So next steps, you know, as we have time, we are adding more points uh, to the study. Um, we're working on um, optimizing the slip geometry to see if we can reduce the uh, damage to the coil tubing. Um, you know, we're always cutting new grades of coil as they become available. Um, you know, a big thing for us is, you know, we have a customer that wants to do something a little bit different and they phone us and say, hey, can you cut this pipe? And if we don't have it in, in inventory, we get them to send it to us. And, and you know, we, we determine if we can cut it or what our optimum shear blades are for that. And, and as an example, we just did some testing for a client in the Middle East where we successfully cut several grades of co-rod with our coil tubing BOPs. And the reason for that is because they are running a um, hybrid string that consists of both coil tubing and hybrid, or sorry, and co-rod. And of course, we'll continue to evolve coil tubing BOPs and pressure control equipment. Uh, we have a new lighter weight version of our 15K five inch BOP coming out in the next couple months. It's just uh, being the first prototypes being manufactured right now. So um, we're looking forward to seeing that soon. Um, you know, we've developed some coil tubing uh, shearing blades that require about half the non-hydraulic pressure that our conventional ones did. Um, and that's something that we've had to do as coil tubing wall thickness has increased and, uh, and uh, strength has increased as well. Uh, we are writing a paper for the upcoming coil tubing conference in uh, the woodlands should it happen on that topic as well. So just like to thank uh, Gary and his team at Global Tubing because they did our bent fatigue testing. Uh, Global Tubing, Tenaris Coil Tubes, Quality Tubing for the coil tubing samples, Trican Well Service and Nexus Energy Technologies for allowing us to make this presentation. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask away. Большое спасибо. У кого есть вопросы к докладчику? Yes, thank you very much. Хорошо, раз вопросов нету, тогда... If we don't have any more questions, then...
послушаем доклад от компании. Успешная реализация фильтрования пробок в первых нетрадиционных горизонтальных газовых скважинах при высоких давлениях 15 тысяч пищай и высоких температурах в ОАЭ. Есть возможность у нас посмотреть этот доклад? Okay. okay, can you hear me? Okay, let me start by saying Previet, Sven Dobridin, and hopefully I just didn't murder your beautiful language. Uh, my name is uh, Jorge Bunge. I'm currently the product engineer, senior manager at Tenaris Cold Tubes. Uh, I've been with Tenaris for 14 years and at the cold tubes facility for the last 10 of those 14 years. Uh, I'm going to show you a presentation about uh, our blue coil technology, our quench and temper uh, pipe, and especially focus on the development of our HT95 grade, which has uh, improved sour fatigue uh, performance. Okay, so first of all, uh, regarding the manufacturing process, uh, at this point, I think everybody is more or less familiar with how cold tubing is produced. It's basically a ERW uh, pipe mill uh, that uh, produces a continuous string of cold tubing. In the case of uh, blue coil technology, uh, the process is a little bit different, even though the pipe is manufactured with the same uh, ERW process, after the pipe has been manufactured, we're going to go through a heat treatment process where the quench and temper uh, takes place. The advantage of the quench and temper process is that allows us to have a completely homogeneous microstructure throughout the entire length uh, of the string without having microstructural differences between the base tube the bias welds and the ERW weld. And is this very homogeneous microstructure that it's gonna uh, increase the fatigue performance uh, of the pipe when we compare it to a, a standard cold tubing uh, grade. Uh, on these slides, you can see uh, what I was just mentioning. You can see on the right side, uh, three microstructures corresponding to the base tube, the bias well, and the heat affected zone of a, of a bias well on the, on the blue coil product. And on the left, you can see the microstructure of the equivalent regions for a conventional cold tubing grade. Uh, you don't need to be a, a expert in metallurgy uh, in order to see that there is a, that the, the microstructures on the, on the right are very homogeneous, while the ones on the left, you can notice differences on the three of them. So this uh, very homogeneous microstructure is what gives us the advantage in, in performance uh, in comparison to uh, conventional uh, cold tubing. Uh, we have several different grades for uh, our blue coil technology, uh, 95, 110, 125, and even 140. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit on the, on the 95 grade. Uh, the 95 grade was specifically designed with uh, sour performance in mind. Uh, it's not that the 110 and the 125 grades don't have a, a, a good performance because they actually do, but usually uh, our customers are trying to uh, abide by the NACE requirements, which, have, which has uh, hardness limitations for products that are going to be used under sour conditions. So with this in mind, we developed the HT95 uh, uh, grade. Specifically talking about uh, sour performance, uh, what testing the sour performance of cold tubing is it's, it's complicated to say the least. So we have the standard HIC testing, we have the standard SSC testing according to, the, to NACE, 
but those tests really don't represent what's going on in the field with cold tubing. So in order to try to emulate the conditions that we have uh, in the wells, we came up with a type of testing that we called sour fatigue. So basically what we do is we take uh, our pipes, we put them inside a chamber under certain conditions. Uh, in this case, it was uh, four days of, uh, uh, of H2S exposure, 100% H2S uh, environment at 14.5 uh, PSI or one bar uh, pressure and uh, with no inhibitors used. So the pipe were completely exposed to the H2S environment. And after the pipe spends four days in those conditions, we take them out. And as soon as we take them out of the chamber, we're gonna put it in our fatigue machine, which is the standard fatigue machine that the industry uses. And we're gonna make the, the fatigue testing. Um, so you can see on this slide, you can see the comparison between our HS90 conventional uh, grade and our uh, different blue coil grades. And you can see that the performance of the, of the blue coil grades, it's way better than the conventional coil tubing. Here is a very important comment that I need to make, is in the case of the conventional coil tubing, the HS90 uh, coil tubing, we only tested base tubes. So there was no bias well involved in this test. The reason being is if you expose to a, 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 a um, environment of 100% H2S for four days at, uh, to a conventional cold tubing with a bias well, that bias well is not gonna last not even one cycle in the fatigue machine. So the, the numbers that you're seeing on the chart, the, the, the 33 cycles and the 28 cycles are only representative of base tube because the bias well wouldn't have lasted not even one cycle. Again, I'm talking about pipe that has been exposed with no uh, inhibition. In the case of the blue coil grades, we not only tested base tube, but we also tested bias wells. So what you're seeing there is a combination of the performance of the base tube and the bias well together. So you can see that there is a big difference uh, between the conventional coil tubing and the blue coil in a, under sour conditions. I have uh, one caveat here is that the HT140 was exposed under uh, much uh, less severe conditions because we know, of course, that the, the higher the yield strength, it, the performance, uh, it's going to be a, a little bit lower when you go cert above certain level. But the grade 95, the 110, and the 125 grades were all tested under the same conditions. So you can see with this uh, chart that all the coil tubing, uh, all the blue coil grades uh, up to 125 have a very good performance uh, under sour conditions when compared to a conventional HS90 or CT90 grade uh, coil tubing. Now, even though we have a really good performance uh, under sour conditions, by no means we're recommending that the pipe is used without using any type of inhibitors or scavengers. The reason why we test the pipe without inhibitors or scavengers is to test the worst possible outcome in a field. So if for whatever reason you're, you're running your operation and you have a problem with the inhibitors and the scavengers, you know that the pipe is not going to fail catastrophically as it would do in the case of a conventional cold tubing. Now, focusing specifically on the, uh, on the HT, this is uh, a little bit of what I was uh, mentioning before. We, we are focusing here a little bit more on the comparison between a conventional 90 grade and a blue coil a 95 grade. Again, the conditions are uh, one bar uh, of, of partial pressure of H2S, 100% H2S, room, temp uh, room temperature, and uh, um, also um, uh, so you can clearly see that the performance of the pipe is vastly superior uh, to any conventional uh, grade uh, cold tubing. Now, we have also done some special testing uh, on the case of the HT95, and this is done uh, by our, some of our customers' requirements. In this particular case, a customer in the Middle East, they not only wanted to perform sour fatigue testing, 
but they wanted to perform, they, they wanted the exposure, not only they didn't want the exposure to be at atmospheric pressure, but they wanted the, the exposure to be at a very high pressure. So we had to develop a special chamber that allowed us to put the pipe at 5,000 PSI or 344 bar uh, of total pressure. Uh, the conditions here were between 8.9, uh, let's say between 9 and 14 bar partial pressure of uh, H2S um, with a mix between 2 to 4 percent of H2S. The, 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 the testing conditions are kind of difficult to, uh, to repeat exactly, so that's why we have a little bit of a variation on the partial pressures and on the percentages of uh, H2S. But basically, the conditions were 2 to 4 percent uh, H2S with 3.1 percent of CO2. And the, the, the balance of gas was done with nitrogen. Uh, we have a pH of uh, 2.7. The exposure time was about 100 hours. And we have about 250,000 milligrams uh, per, uh, per liter of uh, uh, chlorides. Um, there on the right, you can see the results. And here you might notice that on the table, we have samples that have uh, that had inhibition uh, inhibitors used, and we have others that didn't have inhibitors used. Uh, this was at their, our customer requirement. They wanted to see the difference between, you know, what was the performance of the pipe with no inhibitors and the performance of the pipe with inhibitors. Uh, and there is not a very big difference uh, in the results uh, one way or, or another. Now, I have to say that the company that produces the inhibitor says that even though you inhibit the sample, you shouldn't use uh, that sample for more than 24 hours in an H2S environment. And here, the exposure was done for 100 hours. So we went, we went way beyond what the inhibitor company recommended for the, for the exposure. Um, in this slide, you can see the, the results a little bit, uh, a little bit easier uh, to interpret. So what uh, the first uh, the first columns show what would be the the results on a conventional 90 grade cold tubing and uh, then you can see the different results that that we obtained using hd95 uh, the second column shows the the results at, at one bar uh, of uh, partial pressure of 100 uh, percent h2s and then you can see the different uh, the different conditions of this particular test where we use high pressure. Uh, batch one is non-inhibited, batch four is inhibited, uh, batch two is non-inhibited, is non-inhibited, batch five has inhibitor, and so on and so, so forth. So we we got a couple of weird results on the on the on batch one and 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 batch four. Um, these samples were uh, 175 wall, so this was 238 pipe, uh, 175 wall, and you can see that the testing that was done at high pressure, the performance of the pipe was actually better than what the fatigue models predicted, which of course is a, it's a, it's kind of a, a fluke. Now we all know in the industry that the fatigue models uh, are not 100% accurate. So from time to time, you see things like this. You, you see tests that really don't make sense regarding what the model is, is saying. In this case, the fatigue testing gave us a result way better than what the model uh, predicted. Uh, but when you go to the, the, the other samples, which were 238, uh, 250 wall, uh, or 6.4 millimeters, where we tested base tube and, and bias weld, uh, you can see the performance uh, in comparison with the, uh, the, what the model uh, predicted. In any case, the results are way better than the conventional 90 grade that it was typically used in uh, wells with uh, sour conditions. Uh, so this shows that uh, the blue coal product has a, a, a improved performance uh, uh, under sour conditions. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, other uh, it don't necessarily these uh, weird conditions for testing. Uh, we have some experience in the field with the HT95 grade as well. Uh, we have uh, some uh, customers in Europe uh, that used HT95 uh, in the field. In this particular case, uh, the string had about uh, 675,000 running feet. 
Uh, the string reached about 77% of the fatigue life, according to a 100-grade uh, fatigue model. Uh, it performed 74 jobs with no, no failures until the, the customer decided to, to retire it. Uh, for you to have an idea the, of the performance of this string in comparison with a conventional 80-grade uh, string, we perform almost double under similar conditions in comparison to a uh, HS80 uh, grade. Now, what is important is that out of these 74 jobs that the string performed, 60 of them were with uh, uh, in sour uh, with sour conditions, uh, which is, uh, speaks greatly about the performance uh, uh, of the product. And there on the chart on the on the right, you can see that we have a a, a variety of of different jobs that were performed uh, with this string. So we have. Most of the jobs were milling plugs, uh, but we also had cleanouts, uh, uh, completions, and, acid, uh, and also acid jobs. And nevertheless, the string performed uh, flawlessly. We also have another example of a blue coil. In this case, is a HT125 uh, used in the in the Middle East, uh, also with a, a H2S. Uh, this string is still uh, a, is still being used. Uh, the wells in which uh, the string was used had between 1 and 8% of uh, H2S. Uh, the bottom hole pressure was around 110 bars or 13,000 PSI. Um, they did six different runs so far with a maximum wellhead pressure of 713 bars or 10,000 PSI. Um, and the, the pipe is, is performing uh, without any, any issues. Okay, as of uh, what is the, the distribution of, of blue coil, coil tubing around the world, uh, we already have over 940 strings deployed uh, since 2015 when the technology was introduced uh, by Tenaris. Uh, the, we have uh, several different sizes from inch and a half all the way to two and five eighths. Uh, all around the world. We have over 75 customers that are using this technology. We, the pipes have performed over 25,000 jobs around the world. We have a, a total accumulated of almost 540 million running feet uh, with the product. Uh, several customers are consistently achieving uh, over a million and a, a, million and a half uh, running feet uh, with this uh, technology, and even we have the record of uh, the longest run uh, a cold tubing string with over 2.2 million uh, running feet. Uh, so this technology has uh, really revolutionized uh, the industry and, and is pushing things uh, is pushing things uh, forward. Uh, mainly, I mean, this uh, this technology is mostly used in the U.S. Clearly, is the is the biggest market, and that's why you see the, the most of the the strings are concentrated there. But we also have a, a lot of experience in Canada, in 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 Argentina, and in the in the Middle East uh, as as well. Okay, and finally, uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the retirement reasons that we see for this type of technology. Uh, roughly. 50% of the of all the blue coil strings that are in the field were retired voluntarily by the by our customers. So they decided that they have already uh, achieved what they wanted with that particular pipe and they decide to retire it. Of the other 50% that is not retired voluntarily, this is the, the different retirement reasons. So you can see that the vast majority of the strings uh, that were not voluntarily retired had some sort of mechanical damage. This is usually related to uh, field operations. 17% uh, had some sort of uh, uh, corrosion. Usually, this is related to uh, storage uh, practices or the fluids that we see in the in the wells. Uh, and if that, if the corrosion inhibition practices are not proper, you you can have problems. Uh, of course, even though uh, blue coil is a uh, uh, better performing technology, I mean, you still need to take care of it uh, as uh, far as uh, corrosion. 14% uh, of the strings were uh, stuck in the hole. 5% uh, of them had uh, issues with the uh, overload. Again, all these things are related to uh, oper operative issues in the field. 
4% of them have some sort of erosion problem. And the, the big 18% that you see there that is unknown is, unfortunately, not always the customers tell us exactly what happened with the, uh, with the strings. So there is a 18% of, of strings that we really don't know why the customer retarded because we, we didn't get uh, any information about it. Um, and okay, that's uh, pretty much it with this uh, beautiful picture of our Koi Lampai product in Norway. Uh, I open the floor for any questions if you have any. Any questions? Good, thank you. We would uh, like to wrap up the fourth session with a final presentation, which is going to be about synthetic gale from oil prop. Коллеги, добрый день. Перед выступлением хотел бы поблагодарить организаторов, участников конференции. Well, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference. It's good that you were able to manage organizing this conference during these challenging times. You know that I developed the hydrofracturing business at our company. И опыт применения его в нашей компании. Going to speak of the experience that we've had, the experience is quite extensive. You know that the clients now watch the quality of fluids very closely. The fluids that is fed, uh, that are fed down the reservoir, uh, that therefore requirements to synthetic uh, are quite high. We started our operation in 2004 as a producer uh, of carbo ceramic, ceramics prop hands in 2017. Now the owner of the company changed and a well prop company appeared in the market which is part of P. We have factors that enable continuity of the production process in line with the international quality assurance management system. We have more than 20 own proprietary chemical agent brands. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the, about the third gel producing project. This is the amylocritic acid that is used to synthesize the gel forming agent. Here are the physical properties of the chemical agent. We can produce three types of polymers using a single agent. I would like to say a few words about the strengths of the technology since every new technology Every new technology needs to be able to demonstrate some strength, strengths to be able to survive in the market. The most important thing is that uh, we call it uh, the clear liquid, which means uh, that it has the high residual permeability up to 98%, which leads to lower skin factor of the problem pack. Another important benefit is the low tolerance and low sensitivity to the water quality, because water quality is now a major issue. If, for instance, for fracturing, we won't be able to use natural water sources, then we'll have, we'll have to be using technical water. And when, when using WPSG, um, we'll be able to, to obtain specific instructions on how to use technical water with the WPSG agent for gel forming. 
Also, high sand carrying capacity due to low viscosity, and low viscosity also gives the greater extended reach of the fractures. Also, in all jobs we see the lower friction pressure loss because of the polymer qualities and of course simplified simplified recipes because we didn't need the crosslinker and we can use the clay stabilizer now a few words about the core base system they are well studied and tested they're testing Approaches have been standardized. And the basic parameters of the working fluids can be obtained using the rotation viscosity meter. But we need additional research on the dynamic and dynamic performance. And those cosmic meters are and that means that we basically identify the viscous and the viscous index. The resiliency and elasticity have been used in other studies with uh, 3 kilos per cubic meter loads. In addition to the amplitude identifications, we also do the range, the range analysis. As a result of all that, we saw the optimal concentration from 3 to 4.6 grams per cubic meter. A few words about the application of our product. We have conducted 12 successful operations on different model fields by one stream. Currently, the maximum number of stages is 5. The maximum propant weight 90 tons. This development is one of the most extensive ones currently available on the market with a polycrylic in mind. I suggest you have a look at the report from a specific job that we've done with multi stage frag job. This is something that we've done. Here are the well parameters, and the receipt, and charts, performance charts. The stability and sensitivity charts. Whatever we speak about the synthetic uh, gel producing agents, the viscosity is 10 times lower than in the case of the classic core based systems. That still means that it still does not mean that the piece and carrying capacity deteriorates. Also, we have a clear phases for the prop and sedimentation and the photofixation as identified during the time frame. One of the, in terms of, as a result of our research, it is fully complied with the clear liquid requirements usually presented to back jobs. 
видели, что разделение с нефтью происходит происходит по норме, то есть четко ровно, несущая жидкость, способность жидкости позволяет проводить работу с высокими концентрациями пропана. На данном графике вы можете видеть тестовые закачки всех пяти стадий. Как я уже сказал, все стадии, все работы на всех стадиях были по плану, то есть фактически пропан соответствовал of the actual да, content program was exactly the same as anticipated. Uh, uh, Here is the analysis of the well performance yeah, after the fracturing uh, operations, multi-stage fracturing at that point, and the yield was higher by 70%, the water logging went down by 17%, and the fluid content increased by 7%. So what are the findings? From this operation, the recipe that we suggested enabled enhancing the performance and efficiency of the multi-stage, five-stage fracturing as compared to the GOR-based systems. And we also saw after the frac job that the well yield intensified. And for that particular well, you also need to remember that it achieved its uh, production mode in two days, which is a good result. Well, I decided to do the SWOT analysis as a finding of all that effort when we look at the weaknesses and strengths, both externally and internally. Internally, which means all processes going down at the reservoir, and externally, we mean all processes that are required for the, at the preparation stage and during the control fracturing. One of the positive factors for everything in the reservoir is the high residual permeability and our efficiency of the reach of the fracture. While there is a low cost of the preparation, why so? Just before conventional fracturing jobs, we need to heat up the water when working with synthetic gel-producing agents, we can run cold water easily, which is a substantial change in our cost. То есть у нас нету такого риска, что у нас жидкость не будет сшиваться. Если also, подача реагента... We need to make sure that the liquid does not get cross-linked. So if we're following the plan and everything goes as planned, so the decent carrying capacity remains stable. And the background of application is quite successful, 20 jobs. Uh, it's quite good, especially since technology is quite new. We haven't uh, seen any negative factors for the internal processes. As for the weaknesses for the external processes, well, there's a need for, to ensure the liquid quality control in the field because field laboratories are usually equipped with viscosimeter, which is unable to measure accurately the synthetic viscous liquids. And at this point, there is quite formalized to lab testing is still being developed, including by means of uh, our company. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Any questions? Добрый день еще раз. У меня есть пару маленьких уточняющих вопросов. Первый – это как вы замешиваете вашу жизнь? A few questions. How do you mix in the field? What equipment do you need to mix it in the field? 
в проекции на Гуар. Насколько велика разница? Ну, и, и... So how much of a difference does it make as compared to Gorby's project, um, projects? And uh, did you have any experience with uh, salt water? Now the first thing about the wellhead, it was all fed downstream. Was there a mixer? Mixer, yeah. Blender. The second uh, question was about the price as compared to the Gore based systems. Well, of course, it depends on the recipe that, that you follow. But, there's, but, the, but the gap is not substantial. So there are some, of course, there's a difference, but the, price, the end price is compatible. And now, uh, the question about the salt water. Like I mentioned, we chose almost for all our clients the ranges of uh, tolerance for water. Well, of course, with high level of mineralization. So, choosing the recipes when using the synthetic crosslinkers is basically impossible, so we're able to accommodate any water, but it's... No, the question is, in, in the oil fields, no, we haven't had any oil field experience of uh, working with salt water. We're just negotiating with some of the customers. I mean, we have developed some of the recipes, but there has been no practical experience so far. Any questions to the presenter? Good. Thank you for the interesting presentation. I invite all of you to take a 15-minute coffee break, and then we'll reconvene to carry on.